Welcome to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Welcome to the Means of Grace podcast. I'm Jesse Ennis, Director of Communications for the Leadership Development Team. And I'm Kim Ingram. I'm the Director of Ministerial Services for the Annual Conference. And today we are talking to Joel Simpson, the pastor of First United Methodist Church in Taylorsville, North Carolina, where he has been serving for the last four years and getting started on his fifth year. And we wanted to talk with Joel a little bit today about his history and passion for and call to ministry with the poor and justice. He has been involved at the church and in his own life in a variety of ways, responding to needs of people and the least of these. And so I thought maybe, Joel, we could start talking about what you all did during Holy Week at First United Methodist Church. I know that it was featured in an article at that time this year by the annual conference, and it really piqued my curiosity because it looks like you had a focus on kind of the death penalty and how it relates to the last days in Jesus's life. But instead of me trying to tell us more about it, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what it was and how it came about? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me and being willing to engage this kind of conversation. One, the more we engage it in my local context and beyond, I hear more and more people of faith say, oh, I've never had these conversations in my whole life. For example, at the, we called it executing the stations of the cross. And at the end of that event, a gentleman in the seventies came up and said, never had any kind of conversation like this in church before ever. And he was actually someone who was pro-death penalty and thought he could be an executioner. And at the end of that said, I can't do that now. I can't, I can't believe what I used to believe. And I had never had this conversation until now, which I thought was a pretty powerful statement. So how this all came about, Shane Claiborne works with some people on death row in Tennessee, Tennessee's death row unit too. And they had collaborated to paint the stations of the cross, the traditional stations. And they did that in prison. They painted 14 of these stations as well as the resurrection, which is the image I'm showing up right now. So this one, the, the resurrected Jesus, all of them were actually, they were painted on one banner. Well, two banners, they called them scrolls. And a different person painted each station. And Jesus looks very different in all of them. In some images, Jesus is white. In some, Jesus is black. In some, Jesus is Hispanic. It just kind of depends on how who people were and how they were painting and how they saw Jesus. And this image, One of my members at the end came up and said, why does Jesus look so tired? Like Jesus is resurrected and he doesn't look good. He actually looks exhausted and worn. And and so we reflected a little bit on that to say, well, yeah, what does it mean to be resurrected? Does it mean like a triumphal Jesus where everything's perfect? Or does it mean the Jesus that has been through the ringer and has come out the other side and is still going? And, And what does that mean to people who are in the midst of that on death row? and people who are living that day-to-day life. So it really evokes some interesting conversations of the people that were there. And you said all the artists were prisoners that were on death row, correct? Right, all inmates on death row, yeah. We started doing this because this was kind of their wishes. Was We'd love for people to see these images of, of what it means to us and how we can depict this through art. So when Shane had shared this with me, I said, can I just send this out to our whole Methodist conference and invite people to use these images for Holy Week? He loved the idea. So we did that. Then we decided it'd be cool to host the in-person event as we were kind of we we're kind of coming out of COVID at that point. People were more comfortable coming around. And I invited, I asked my district, the Appalachian district, if they'd be willing to host the event and advertise it and let people know about it. And that's so we kind of built it around that. And Shane Claiborne came and participated in it with you. Right. Yeah. So, Joel, it seems that I remember that you and Julia Trantham went on behalf of the conference to the Young Adult Clergy Leadership Forum that the General Board of Church and Society sponsored. It seems like for several years, we could send two young clergy to, um, to meet along with other young clergy for this forum. Is that right? Did you, did you and Julia participate in that? Yeah, we did. And that was an awesome experience for me. I can't speak for Julia, but I think it was for her too. 
because you were surrounded by all these people who thought justice mattered and compassion mattered and politics mattered. And it's actually part of our faith. How we right, politics is just how we navigate life together. And that matters. Jesus cared about that. So a very cool program because everyone may not know this. I didn't know until I got up there, but we have a United Methodist building that faces the Capitol. One of the things I really remember is someone saying, yeah, we, the door faces the Capitol and it's a glass door. And they said, we just imagine, you know, everyone in the Capitol knowing we're watching you, right? We're, we're here paying attention to what you're doing and you're, you're not getting by without us knowing what's going on. And it's right next to the Supreme Court. So it was great to be able to spend some time up there. We talked about you know, budgets being moral documents. We got to go into the Senate and meet with the chaplain of the Senate. He shared a lot of just stuff he does and how he navigates the different senators and political parties. And Shane Claiborne came and he brought some of his garden tools. He beats guns into garden tools. Thinking of the Bible, right? They'll beat their weapons into plowshares. And I shared a little bit about nonviolence and what we're trying to do. And that was the first time I met Shane was then. I bought one of his books, the Book of Common Prayer for Ordinary Radicals is what's called. And when he signed it, he signed, uh, may we become the church we dream. I just thought, oh, isn't that what we all want? And here are all these people together dreaming of what that looks like. Yeah, so it was a great experience to know there's all these people of faith and the whole organization within our denomination that really cares about this stuff. And it's not just, you're not alone in it. So that also helped me say, oh yeah, okay, we should begin doing some of this, right? I care about this personally. And so let me just get started in some small way because there's other people and I'm friends with a lot of them on social media. And I see a lot of them doing a lot of the same things, just speaking out about stuff, caring about stuff, saying stuff, showing up in places, trying to be advocates. So it's again, a reminder, none of us are in this alone. We all, we all do really want the same stuff and we're all really working for the same stuff. We're all struggling in the same ways. For people who might not know Shane Claiborne, we will put in the show notes a link to some of his work and who he is because he's part of the Red Letter Christians along with Tony Campolo and has done a lot of justice. And we'll put that in the show notes. We'll also make those images available in the show notes as well. What were the expectations? You highlighted the title, Executing the Stations of the Cross. What were the expectations around the event before it actually happened? And if you could tell us a little bit about how people responded to it once it actually happened. Well, our expectations were really to invite people into a conversation, not to make people change their minds about anything. But how we approached it was, here are people's stories, people who, so we took it from the victim's perspective of, hey, these are victims who their family members have been murdered. And in one instance, there was a pastor who was murdered and his daughter was right there. She was also stabbed. And he was, so her dad had told her just weeks before, like, I'm never murdered. I don't want the death penalty for anybody. And so she tried to advocate for the person who did the crime to not get the death penalty. And he got the death penalty. So thankfully, and over a couple of a series, you know, it takes a really long time, but over a series of appeals and things that happened, she continued to advocate for him to not get the death penalty. And they realized how difficult it was for victims to actually have a say over what happens in their lives. And so often what we don't realize is what juries decide and what judges decide impact people and families in ways that we don't ever think about or realize, including the victims. And so to hear those stories from victims who had compassion for, to say, no, there's something we care about redemption and we believe God can transform people. And so we believe we're taking away the work that God can do if we execute people. So to hear those stories, both from people who do executions and from executioners themselves. Shane had shared the story of an executioner who he was performing execution. He said, you know, after just had nightmares, like these people, they haunted me and I could not get away from it. And so we don't realize what this kind of stuff does to individuals and to people and to communities and to people we think we're helping and we're actually hurting. It's just far more complicated than we often realize. Did you have much resistance for hosting it in your congregation or in your community? No, at least not that I'm aware of. And we had people 
we did a and a at the end. And I think that was a really important piece. Shannon and I talked about that. And there were people who were still very firmly, you know, no, I think some people need to face the death penalty and be executed. And so we were able to kind of think through some of that publicly, you know, in, in a big group, and then also talk one-on-one afterwards. And not to change anyone's mind, but to get better clarity on why do people feel like that? And, and where does this come from? And how does this play into our faith? And what it means when we see people say, everyone's made in the image of God, and God is gracious and compassionate and leaving space for the spirit to work and transform. There's a quote in the article that the communications team wrote that says, you can't change anyone's mind by having an argument with them. Minds are changed when hearts are changed through stories and conversations with the people whose lives are directly impacted. Was that your experience? It sounds like from the story you told us in the very beginning, even that impact was made in Taylorsville. I think so. I think with most difficult conversations and topics, it's, it's easy to come at it from one perspective. Once you start hearing real stories and meeting, and I think proximity is, is key for a lot of these things, right? We have a prison ministry at First Taylorsville. So to go into the maximum security prison and spend time with people there and hearing their stories, uh, the congregation really has a heart for that because they know the people. They know them face to face. And so that shifts how you feel about it and how you think about it. And it's not just a somebody somewhere. It's Joe, who I know and have spent time with and spent a year doing disciple Bible study with. It makes a difference. So the church already had a connection with persons in prison. Like that, there, this was building on a ministry and, and a passion that the church already had some experience with when you hosted it. Yeah, absolutely. If there were somebody listening to this podcast that was interested in learning more about how to connect in prison ministry or develop relationships in that way, would you be able to help them with that? Could we put your contact information or maybe you could give us somebody at the church that could, could be a contact for that? Sure. Yeah, be happy to do that. What's been something surprising that's come out of that prison ministry for you? Well, I was told when I came to First Taylorsville, I was told, whatever you do, make sure you take part in that. And so my first time going in to be a part of worship there, it felt like, I mean, I even use these words. I was like, this is real church. Like, this is real church right here. And it, it's the group who goes regularly. And we haven't been able to do it for a little bit because of the pandemic. But everyone wants to go. Everyone always wants to be there. There's something, right? You feel something. So there's something happening. And that, and to be in proximity, shifts and changes how you think and how you move. And so for me, that was a surprising piece because actually I'd never been inside the prison before until I came. That helped catapult a lot of things in my ministry and how I think. So speaking of that, Joel, talk to us a little bit, if you would, about how you have developed And maybe this was kind of some of the initial starts for it. But I know you went to the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, just really a couple of weeks ago. Help us to know kind of your internal personal journey or maybe your faith journey that has connected you to kind of these, the basic needs for people around improving their lives and making their lives more fair and just. Yeah, it's been and still is like a, kind of one of these slow growing processes. I was trying to think through this yesterday, just like, how did I end up there, right? (laughs) Because sometimes you just end up doing stuff like, what was the path that brought me there? And I can't point to any one thing, but a million small things. So one small thing being the, the prison ministry. Another small thing being, we've got a local soup kitchen that's in our old church building, our mission campus, and I drive the food truck. And I did that intentionally to say, uh, well, I stopped going to Rotary. And instead of going to Rotary Club, I drive the food truck. Because I said, I see these people in a lot of the social places I go to. Who do I not see? Who am I not connecting with? Let me drive the food truck. Because these are people that I'm not going to see at any of these community events necessarily. They're not going to come to the church. And that was something I did for me. To say, how do I need to grow? And, and how is God trying to save me still? So tell us about the food truck ministry, because it doesn't sound like it's kind of the food truck that goes to the festival on Friday night and sells hot dogs and hamburgers to the people that are showing up for the concert. 
So it's called the 957 Mobile Cafe. And it was birthed out of another church, actually. It comes from Luke 957 is the name. And our church has really embraced that. And there are a lot of churches in the community that help out and they prepare food in the evenings and then serve meals Monday through Friday at our old church building. And there's also a food truck. It started out just as a food truck that drove around to different locations in the county. So that still happens three or four days a week. It drives to a different food pantry. So when people are going to get food and help at food pantries, there's also a lunch or a dinner for them. And so at one point they were needing help driving. I said, oh, I'd love to, yeah, let me jump in and do that. And it also made me think, what do I have on my plate that I don't need to have on my plate? Or what do I have on my plate that might be good to just transition right now. Not that Rotary is bad. Rotary is a great group. And I try and tell them that it's a great group. I need to do this thing. And that shifted that, the prison ministry, those kinds of things shifted things. I went down to or over to Raleigh for what we're calling Freedom Fridays. There was a guy named Dante Sharp who was put in prison for, I think it was about 24, 25, 26 years for a crime he never committed. And I had stumbled across his story and they were beginning the very first week of, Hey, he was released and he was exonerated, but he wasn't pardoned. And so in North Carolina, the deal is you can get out of prison and be free and not be charged for anything, but you cannot be pardoned unless the governor pardons you personally. So what that means is you still have a criminal record. You're still a felon. So that affected where he could or couldn't live, the kind of jobs he could or couldn't work. And if you're far, falsely imprisoned, you're also owed money for every year you're in prison, up to $750,000. So Dante was owed $750,000 in addition to all these other things. And he'd been out of prison for two or three years at this point and still hadn't been pardoned. Can you not get the money unless you're pardoned? Right. So all these things kind of coalesced. And for whatever reason, Governor Cooper had not signed the pardon. So I heard this story and me and my brother traveled over to Raleigh and participated in that first Freedom Friday. And Reverend Barber was there, who's with the Poor People's Campaign. And the president of the NAACP was there. And there was a, a lot of a lot of these groups kind of connect together in a lot of these, these big works they do. So the more you get connected and participate and show up, the more you're going to see a lot of the same faces who are helping lead and being advocates. Because my understanding of advocate is you're you're somebody who shows up. It doesn't mean you're the face of the thing, but you're you're there to help and support in whatever ways you can. So when I was there, I also learned one of my church members helped make a documentary about Dante Sharp's story. And so it all just kind of connected in ways I didn't even realize. And I went back for the next few weeks. It took several months for... Cooper to sign that bill and pardon him. And there are other people who needed to be pardoned as well. And the president of the NAACP in the 70s committed to sleeping in his car outside of Governor Cooper's house until he would pardon Dante. And I mean, that was a couple, two, three months. In the middle of winter, it's cold. He tried to sleep on in a tent outside the property. He wasn't allowed to because of <laughs> he'd be arrested. So he's like, well, I'll just sleep in my car right here. I was like, well, that's definitely less comfortable. So it was in kind of that connection and getting involved there that I connected more with the Poor People's Campaign and ended up going back to Raleigh for some of the Poor People's Campaign rallies that happened there and then ended up going up to D.C. on June 18th this year. So will you tell us a little bit about that experience? I saw some about it on Facebook and saw where clergy were involved with it. Did you wear a collar or stole or something that identified you as clergy? So I wore my Mr. Rogers T-shirts that one of my church members gave me that said, hello, neighbor, and showed up just as, again, uh, as an advocate, as one of the many who came to be a part of that. And there were 500 buses from around the country that the Poor People's Campaign had organized that you could hop on and go and cost maybe $100 round trip. So I went back and forth, should I drive? Should I ride on the bus? And I thought, well, why would I drive? Because I'm going to get up there. I'm not going to know anybody. But I think also in a lot of these movements and a lot of advocacy, we forget that it's it's about the movement and it's about the community and it's about the stories and it's about the connection and it's not about me. So I'm going to ride the bus because this is the story. These are the people. This is the the movement. If you're not familiar with the Poor People's Campaign, they're 
some of the talking points are 140 million people who are poor and low wealth in the United States. That's 42% of the country, 52% of our children. There are some key issues they're focusing on. Things like racism, things like war economy. We spend more on war. We spent $6 trillion on Afghanistan and Iraq. And yet we have 42% of our country who are poor and low wealth, meaning one emergency away from being poor because something happened or one paycheck away from being in poverty. But we spend this much on our, our military. If we could divert just a little bit of our military budget, we could shift all kinds of things. 52% of every dollar goes to the Pentagon, to every federal dollar. Knowing all of that, I was like, yeah, I want to I want to be with people who are really that's almost half the country, right? We're, we all know those stories and those are our stories. So I hopped on the bus and it was like three in the morning, 3.15 or something. We drove up and we came back that night. It was just a one day there and back. That morning, our person who was kind of over the poor people's campaign and over that bus invited people to share stories. And one of the guys sitting across from me, his name was James and he was 18. And he got up to share why he was going and why he was there. And he said, the reason I'm here is because I'm 18 years old. I can barely find a place to live with roommates that I can afford. My fiance has cancer and we, neither of us have health insurance, even though we both work full time. And so for the last two years, we haven't done any treatments for her because we can't afford it. And he said, everything about this just feels wrong to me. And this isn't the life I want. And this is, I'm 18 years old. This shouldn't be how life is. And you just hear story after story after story that is just like that. And so when we got to the, the march, which wasn't really a march, it was more we set up a stage and states marched in with their banners. So there was almost a representative from every state that spoke. And it was people who, they're one of the 140 million and just shared their stories for five hours. This is, this is what's going on in my life. This is why I'm here. The first guy who shared, all three of his children committed suicide. And he's a Native American and his daughter committed suicide. He said she had been getting help and she wanted to go get help when she needed it. And she was denied because her insurance told her she had already gotten too much help and they wouldn't pay for anymore. So when she needed it the most, she couldn't get it. And that kind of started the cycle for his other two children. And a mother who talked about how she worked two or three jobs her entire life and was never actually a mother to her children because she was just trying to provide for them. And so they grew up essentially without a mother, but with someone who would provide. Or a father who said, I grew up in poverty. I'm still in poverty. I'm trying to start a family, which is the American dream. And I'm making it by because of food stamps, because I can't find a job that will pay me enough. And now I'm here as I'm about to have my second child, they're taking baby formula out of the food stamp program or the WIC or the SNAP's benefit program. So how am I going to provide from, how am I going to afford that? Right? You're, you're going to take food out of my child's mouth, but then also punish me when I can't provide food for my child. And so we heard these stories. The one that really, I think, floored a lot of people was there's this place called Cancer Alley in Louisiana. It's like this 75 mile or 80 mile stretch. and what happened was the government allowed these chemical companies to come in and move into this territory and they bought up all the white neighborhoods and left all the black neighborhoods and wouldn't buy their property. So there's something like 150 chemical companies there and no one would buy this property. So none of these people can move because all their equity is in their homes and they're trapped there. And there's just a huge amount, a huge increase of people who have cancer, who have sicknesses because of we know the air is polluted. We know the water is polluted. There's chemical companies 100, like 1,500 feet away from a children's elementary school right there in the community. And you just start hearing these stories and you start really, wow, we really have ignored this problem over and over and over again, haven't paid attention. Bernice King was there, MLK's daughter. And this is a, the Poor People's Campaign is a continuation of what MLK first initiated. And he was assassinated before that ever took place in 1968, but it still happened back then. And this is a, a fusion coalition, what we call a fusion coalition. So it's not one political party. It's not about one race. It's not about, right? It's all these groups coming together. And 
we're not going to be quiet about this anymore. Uh, so she said, it seems that the least of us is becoming the most of us. And I just thought, man, isn't that the truth? 42% of the country. When Jesus said, care for the least of these, is that even a thing anymore? So I'm hearing these stories and I'm wondering, why is it that we don't hear about this more? Between the stories that you're telling and these difficult situations that folks are in, but also you mentioned the responsibility of the juror and the responsibility of the judge and the responsibility of the governor and all of these things that we don't really know. I didn't know that there was a difference between being released from prison and being pardoned. Where do we get this information? Because I have a sense that there are many people in the church that would love to be a part of this, but either don't know that there are these types of needs or they don't know who to talk to, where the power is, where to even start. Yeah, I think that's everyone's question in a lot of ways. And, and how many times do you start something and watch it fizzle out? To, you begin and people begin with a lot of passion and a lot of energy. And then you face a couple of hurdles or something goes wrong and it doesn't happen. So I think that's the, the constant question and dealing with the weariness of just the pandemic and trying to make it through day to day life which I think is why I'm so encouraged by movements like the Poor People's Campaign, because it is a grass-led movement. Right? It's the people who are, who are leading it. It's not someone coming in saying, I know what's best. The, everyone who's a leader, everyone who's speaking, everyone who's a part of it is one of the 140 million, and they're helping shape this movement. So to give people ownership of that, I think, becomes essential and critical. As far as finding out information, I can only tell you, I've, I've just stumbled into it just by showing up in places and trying to be an advocate. So when I think about, I think about stories in the Bible of where are people advocates. The first example, uh, Liz Theo Harris, who is one of the co-chairs for the Poor People's Campaign, she says, she thinks of the, the widow and the judge. And you remember the, the widow keeps showing up to the judge and the judge will not listen to her and he'll keep ignoring her, but she keeps showing up. And then the judge gets scared that she's going to give her a black eye, whether that's a political black eye or a literal black eye or a metaphorical, I don't know. At least in the movements I'm engaged in, it wouldn't be a physical black eye because we would do nonviolence. But it's always nonviolent direct action. And so she keeps showing up till he listens and she shows up for herself. So that's one, one way to be an advocate, right? You show up for yourself. And then I think of people like the midwives in Egypt, Shepra and Fua, right? They're, they're showing up and they're being advocates for their people which they're also in that situation. I think of like Miriam, Moses' sister. She shows up. I think of Moses and I think of Aaron, right? All of these people are advocates in different ways. And as they're showing up and they're just listening and they're paying attention, they end up getting more and more involved and they end up learning a little more and they end up getting plugged in more. And that's been my story, right? I, I just have shown up and hey, here's been the next thing and here's been the next thing and here's been the next thing. That would be my suggestion for people. Don't try and move the world. I think one of the things that's been so exciting and fun for me to see is everybody doing this work. They're just such ordinary people. Unremarkable. I mean, <laughs> ordinary people, which is the remarkable thing. You're looking at, you're looking, you're thinking about people like Bernice King, or you're thinking about people like MLK, or you're thinking about people like Reverend Barber. And, and they are amazing and we need them. And they're gifted people. But the people who are doing the work are the ordinary people. You're, you're never going to know their names. And these stories, you're going to hear the stories, you'll never remember them. And that means something. Well, and we'll put the link to the Poor People's Campaign in the show notes, or you could just Google it and you could find it. And they have a regular email that they send out. So well, I really appreciate that. You know, you said you did sort of one easy thing and one easy thing, and, and they probably feel like that to you now. And maybe they even felt like that when you did it. But it's not nothing. Like it was something that you had to sacrifice some time and some effort and some energy. You said you even gave something else up so that you could make time to to do something intentionally. And I, I just feel like that's such a helpful example. And then one thing led to the next, led to the next. So it, it did snowball, I guess, to some degree where you got more and more involved or more and more. But going to Raleigh, I mean, that's not quick and easy. Spending the day in D.C. where you said something about 3.15, like you, you lost some sleep over that. And, you know, so 
I don't want to minimize what it feels like that you've done even as you've taken this journey. And what I hear you saying is that it doesn't take somebody with a lot of extra time or energy or money or anything to do it. They're the kinds of things that anyone with some commitment and interest in it can follow. It made me think of kind of where two or three are gathered, that it's really about community. It's about people gathering to make a difference collectively, that it's not something you have to figure it out on your own. It's something that together people are able to witness and make a difference. Yeah. And I think some of that's been easier too, because as you meet people along the way, all of a sudden it's not, you don't feel solo, right? You're connected and that connection keeps that movement going. So the Poor People's Campaign will be back in DC in September. And they've committed to bring 5,000 people to do a, a sit-in in in the capital. When I came back from D.C., I shared what I shared with you guys and a little more with the congregation in, in a sermon. And afterwards, I was talking with people and they said, well, what, what's next? I told them, oh, yeah, well, well 5,000 people at least are going to go up and do this direct action. And I had members saying, oh, I'll go. I'll go get arrested. I'll go sit in and make that happen. I was like, not everybody's ready to do that. That's okay. And you're not necessarily going to get arrested, right? <laughs> well, probably. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that'll be the move. Probably to, will get arrested. That's what yeah. a sit-in is. <laughs> a lot of times when we speak of direct action and movements, it is about where can you press the buttons to get things noticed. And, and sometimes it's even intentionally to bring it to court and to have a court case. And so that's something I've been learning over the years, too, is every, every protest or every movement isn't the same. And to pay attention to some of those and ask some real questions about, hey, what are your goals here? What are you trying to do here? What are your intentions here? Because some of it's just to release some anger or some frustration, which is fine. And some of it is to be intentional and and methodical and strategic in what you do. We used to not have the death penalty at one point in time. In 1972, the U.S. brought the death penalty back. So it's been 50 years. This is the 50-year anniversary of having the death penalty back. And that day was just this past weekend. So every year, there's a group that does a fast for over the death penalty, and they sit in front of the Supreme Court and do their fast. So we stop to just kind of cheer them on and say, hey, grateful for you guys and what you do. And, and I didn't stay and I didn't fast, right? But I showed up when I had, because I had the opportunity and, and that was fun and everyone enjoyed it and I enjoyed it. And my point of that is, they're strategic on what they do, right? Some years they're going to intentionally go on to the Supreme Court steps and they're going to get arrested because they want to bring it to court to make a point about something. Because a lot of times, like we see in the Supreme Court right now, that you look back at previous rulings to make new rulings and new judgments and new things. So there's some strategy to some of these things as well. And I think of I think it's Colossians where Paul writes that Jesus makes a spectacle, right? His death made a spectacle of the principalities and powers so that the cross isn't just the cross is a spectacle the cross is making a point and it's drawing people's attention and pointing out how ridiculous this whole thing is and so i i like to think of a lot of movements like that how are we making a spectacle of the ridiculousness of what's happening 140 million people 42 percent of the country why we're executing people and how many of these people are innocent how many of these people have completely changed their lives around. We executed somebody who was like 72 and dying of cancer. You know, I mean, like we do crazy things. It's like, why is it? How do we make a spectacle of this so people realize? Because when you look at the news, that's the only thing that gets the headlines anyway. So let's let's flip it on its head and do it in the way we need to to help the King of Heaven show up and room for the Spirit to move. Joel, that makes me think. I know that you said first Taylorsville was already involved in some prison ministry before you got there. And and that was important for you to be a part of. I wonder if you have any thoughts, if there's a leader listening, whether it's a lay leader, clergy leader, somebody that's involved in a church listening to this podcast that would really like their church to to be involved in some kind of justice or, you know, anti-poverty or anti-gun or anti-death penalty, you know, whatever their passion might be but it's not something that already exists in their church. Do you have any thought for how you might introduce something like that in a congregation or or to try to find other people in a church that might also be interested in something like that? Yeah, the ways we've kind of done it, and I've kind of done it in the past, is I literally just ask people, Would you? are you interested in this? Would you like to be a part of this? What do you think of that? Before being in Taylorsville, I was at Mount Zion and Cornelius. And part of their story is there's a Confederate monument on front lawn there. Maybe you've read about it. When I was there, that 
monument was spray painted. That was around the time of Charlottesville. So that got spray painted and that then caught the news in a whole new way. And we kind of capitalized on that, a lot of the clergy in the area and did a prayer vigil. And from that prayer vigil, what we did was we said, we're going to start racially diverse small groups to begin conversations and connecting people in our community and gave some stats on like how disconnected people who are white are from people who are black, like how many white people have friends who are not white and kind of listed all this stuff. And then people signed up and we started started to launch it. And I looked around and realized who are, who's going to lead this, right? All of us, all of us white clergy just said this comment, right? There's something wrong with that. And so then it became this conversation of, well, oh, who, who, who's interested in this and who would enjoy this? And they don't have to be church members, but who are the people in the community who value this and want to do this work? And so we brought together a group of people and they're still leading that. They've actually become a 501c3 or they're a 501c4, excuse me, called Unity and Community. And they have a whole mission and vision of what they're doing and continue advocating in the community and, and doing that work in very political and, and real ways that are impacting real communities in that area that are going through gentrification and trying to avoid that and just huge things. And so that's the model I've tried to pay attention to. Like, oh yeah, it doesn't even have to be somebody in the church. It just has to be somebody who has a heart like Jesus has for a particular issue. And I only found that out by just calling people and emailing people and send, and asking around. Then it unfolded. And other people jumped on because of that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's really encouraging, especially being a pastor who has tried that type of thing before, getting a group of people together who are very excited about talking about racial injustice. And like you said earlier, sometimes these things get started, everybody's really excited, and then as time goes on, it can kind of fizzle out. So it's really encouraging to hear stories of those situations that grow into being something else and that are being consistent and that are um, tackling these issues. Yeah, and don't think... I just listed some good stuff. There's plenty of bad, you know, like we've tried in Alexander County. It, it went for eight weeks or something and it was great. But then there was like, where do we go from here? And it kind of fizzled out or we tried to, we got together a great group of people to, we don't have a homeless shelter or any, any kind of transitional housing or anything in the county. And so we, we started working on that and that just kind of has, has fizzled out and lost steam. And, and at the same time, I think, okay, it's not, that's not the end, right? It's just, what's the next move here and and will it come back around and how does that look? So yeah, definitely more failure than success, I'd say. Well, I love your heart to continue trying because I think a lot of people, they start, it fizzles out and they're like, this is not for me. I'm never going to do this again. But I love that you've kind of continued and, and keep pressing forward. It gives folks like me a lot of hope. Well, it's cause, only because I see other people do the same thing, right? They're like, I think we're so connected in so many ways that And maybe this is just me, but like I can look at people who are doing something amazing and think, man, they're amazing. And they are amazing. And they're just ordinary people. Like the more people I meet who've done something that I'm so impressed by and so wowed by and so overwhelmed by, when I hear their story or meet them or talk with them or or even see the thing that they've built or helped create, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's nothing really miraculous about this beyond just, yeah, anybody can do this. We can all do this. A willingness to be used. Yeah. And so as strange as it is, it's, it's encouraging and humbling and kind of levels the playing field for all of us. Joel, I have really appreciated this conversation and, and the time that you've been willing to give us to kind of help us to know personally how you have connected and gotten involved, but also what it means to be a leader in, in a Christian church, in a United Methodist church, and, and doing this ministry collectively, both locally, kind of at the state level, and then you've even gone beyond that to kind of the federal level and joined with people across the country in doing some of this work. And I really appreciate that. So do I. Like you said, the least of these, even though that percentage and that number, it's growing. These, these, this is the direction we need to go in. This is the priority that we need to have. And so I I really appreciate you sharing your story and your interactions with all of those other stories and pointing us in the right direction. And This has been really encouraging, and I know that our listeners will be as well. Yeah, thanks. Can I just add one more thing? I have fun at all of this. None of these events, you think, I don't know what people imagined or what I imagined, right? But all of this is always like 
yes, there are very serious moments and there are very difficult moments. And yet there's always laughter and fun and people who are encouraging each other. And some of these things you just need to do because it's fun, right? Because you enjoy it. Because you're like, what would it be like to get arrested? Let's try it. Let's see what it's like, you know, in the best sense, in the best sense. Yeah. You know? What would it be like to show up with people and chant some stuff? I find more and more the people who are invested in this for all their lives, they, they have like this deep joy that doesn't seem, you wouldn't think it's a part of it, but it is. So it's cool to see. Well, thank you, Joel, for sharing this time with us. Thank you for the encouragement, for the reminder that it takes very ordinary people like you and me to do this work. But as we come together, we can do some really extraordinary things. So thank you for the encouragement, for the hope, and for the reminder of the work that's needed to be done and for our participation in that work. And we'll keep working and keep praying that God will guide us in that direction and give us the spirit to do greater things that, than Christ did. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you for listening to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We hope you enjoy listening to these podcasts and use them as a way to stay connected to our community. Remember to subscribe to Means of Grace for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us an honest rating and a review. It helps others find this podcast. Follow the WNCC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WNCCUMC. Once again, that's at WNCCUMC. Means of Grace is produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church and Andy Go of Gojo Studios. 